gospel truths. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, our only confidence that our souls belong to Him. That second verse, if you struggle with anxiety, right? What truth can calm the troubled soul? Oof, your soul troubled? God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? How can we know that God is good in our great Redeemer's blood, right? We have a great God. We can sing hallelujah to Him. Our hope springs eternal, as He puts it. And then that last verse, right? Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, He lives. What a picture, right? He lives. Christ lives. What reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him. We will rise to meet the Lord. Sin and death will be destroyed. Any of you looking forward to that day? Sin and death are destroyed. We will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. What a great hope we have. We have hope in Christ and in Christ alone. We're going to let our kids be dismissed here for worship kids style. I see some of them have already um, jumped the gate and are out there already. They're excited to go, so kiddos can be dismissed at this time. We are going to be in the book of Revelation here as we look at our last uh, sermon here in Building Christ-Centered Homes. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. But before we begin, let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, we are thankful that we have hope. Lord, we think today of a saint, Lord, Pastor Chuck Brawley, one who many here knows. Lord, his health is failing him. His body is failing him, but yet each day his soul is ever more alive as he gets closer to his Savior. Lord, it is through Christ and Christ's resurrection that we have hope. It is in his hope that we can say that God is good even in the midst of troubles. That is, Lord, why we come before him. We say, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Why we look forward to the day where every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow and say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, we pray that you, that your kingdom would come and that in our lives, not only would we recognize you as the great king, but we would live as if you are the great king. Lord, thank you for hope. Thank you for joy. Thank you for peace. And Lord, thank you that you have not left us alone. Lord, today I pray that you would encourage us from your word, that you would instruct us from your word, and that through the hearing of your word, Lord, we would grow to be more like your great son. Lord, it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen. We have been talking about building Christ-centered homes. The very onset, we said that those who want to endure, those who want to endure through life, they ought to be wise, they have to be wise by building on the words of Jesus Christ, right? The foolish man and the wise man. They both worked just as hard. One didn't labor harder than the other. They both labored just as hard, but yet one endured and one did not. It wasn't that one house had nicer appliances or one house had wood floor and the other had just laminate. The difference between the two is what they were built on. The one built on Christ, His words, what He says is true and what is right and what is good. The one that was built by faith on Christ endured. The one that's built on anything else will fail. So as we looked at that, we then started to unpack some instructions, specific instructions related to homes, whether you are a husband or a wife or a child or a parent or you are single or it's just the two of you. We looked at some specific instructions. Last week, we asked ourselves a question. We said, how could we know if we are following these things? And we said, well, the test of our faithfulness, the test of our living with Christ at the center of our home is the test of not, the test is if we obey or not, right? We said it more succinctly. We said that the test of faithfulness is the test of obedience. How do we know if we're building our lives on Christ? How do we know if our marriage looks like Christ, if our family, if our children? How do we know do we obey? 
That was the most simple question we could ask ourselves. It reveals who we fear. It reveals who we worship. We took encouragement to the fact that we are not alone, right? God is with us. And we took encouragement with the fact that there is reward for those who obey. Not only do they endure, but when they meet Christ, there is a reward. Today is our last look at this topic And I want to ask ourselves again, you know me, a question. And the question is rather simple. Why bother? Isn't that Eeyore, I think? Why bother, right? Why bother with Christ? Why bother seeking to understand his words and by faith diligently building on the foundation? Why bother with any of it? Life's short. Life's exhausting i got other things that are important in my life. Maybe you might even say some of these instructions, maybe for wives or husbands, they just seem like antiquated. Why bother hearing the Word, studying the Word, and then trying to discipline ourselves to, by faith, obey it? Why bother with it? I think our answer comes from our text today. Revelation chapter 19. In our text today, we get a portrait of Jesus. I love that word portrait, a picture. We are given many different portraits of Jesus. We get one in the gospel accounts, right? This perfect Savior. We can envision that in our minds, you know, that Christmas card picture, right? We get a portrait of Christ, the resurrection, joyfully embracing his disciples. Here we get the final portrait of Christ, and it is different than the others. You see, Christ is the conqueror. So let us read chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 11, and we're going to divide our text. We're going to read through the whole bit, and then we're going to come through it. But we have a very simple outline today, um, and that's the only slide I have, so I can put this down now. Uh, That is the simple way we can understand our text. We see this portrait of Christ. We can say Christ is revealed And then we can see what Christ does when he returns. So let us begin chapter 19, starting in verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and here came a white horse. With the one riding it was called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and goes to war. His eyes are like a fiery flame, and there are many diadem crowns. Oh, there's that one word, right? Diadem on crowns on his head. He has a name written that no one knows except himself. He is dressed in clothing, dipped in blood. He is called the Word of God. The armies that are in heaven, dressed in white, clean, fine linen, were following, on, following with on white horses. From his mouth extends a sharp sword, so that with it he can strike the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. And he stomps the winepress of the furious wrath of God, the all-powerful. He has a name written on his clothing and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw one angel standing in the sun, and he shouted in a loud voice to all the birds flying high in the sky, Come, gather around for the great banquet of God, to eat your fill of all the flesh of kings, the flesh of generals, the flesh of powerful people, the flesh of horses and those who ride them, and the flesh of all people, both free and slave, and great and small, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the king of the earth and their armies assembled to do battle with the one who rode the horse and with his army. Now the beast was seized. And along with him, the false prophet who had performed the signs on his behalf, signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire, burning with sulfur. The others were killed by the sword that extends from the mouth of the one who rode the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves with their flesh. This is definitely a different picture, a different portrait of Jesus from a Christmas card. This is different from our Easter cards. But yet this is the most powerful picture. Perhaps we should have pictures of Christ like this that we should mail each other. 
Let's examine the revelation of Christ. Let's look at this picture we get of Jesus here. Verse 11. Saw heavens opened. There is an immediacy to this text. And there came this one. He's riding a white horse. Now, our text, as you probably and hopefully figured, is rich with symbolism. There are many places where it is clearly symbolic, some places where it is clearly not symbolic, and some places where it's hard to decide which camp it's supposed to be in. A white horse is a picture here of a military conquest. When the Romans and their generals would go and conquer a country, they would come back and there would be this great celebration and this great parade on these horses entering in and everyone would cheer on the conquering general. That is the picture. Now, there are some who think that Christ might not actually be literally riding on a horse. There's a possibility he will, a possibility he won't. Why do I say that? Consider the book of Acts, right? The story at the beginning where the disciples are there, Jesus goes up. What do the angels say? He's going to return in the same way. So, he didn't leave with a horse. He might not come back with a horse. Zechariah describes him on standing on the Mount of Olives. So it's possible he can ride down on the horse and get off and stand, okay? But the symbolism is what is important here, the picture of a conquering general. The one riding it, he's called faithful and true. There are four names for Christ given here. This is the first. Faithful and true are really one name together. He does everything he promises to do. He does everything. He, he gives eternal life. He promises that, and he follows through with it. He promises judgment. He follows through with it. He is the anti-politician. He does what he says he will do. He is faithful and true. It says with justice, he judges and goes to war. This is an action. There are four actions, just like there are four names here. He judges. He goes to war. What? This is Christ going to war? Yes. There's an interesting reference in Exodus chapter 15. Describes God. It says, "The Lord is a warrior." Again, this isn't Christmas card stuff. He judges. He goes to war. He does it with justice. I think John MacArthur is correct. Whenever you put something before the word justice, is no longer biblical justice. This is not social justice that he comes and he applies. He holds his standard here. Verse 12, his eyes are like a fiery flame. There are many diadem crowns on his head, more descriptions of him. Now, is it possible that he's going to have flames coming out of his eyes? Possible is probably more symbolic. It can be symbolic of zeal, right? We're burning with anger. Our eyes are burning with passion. It could be a picture of that. It could also be a picture of understanding and uh, discerning others, seeing right through and trying them, like trial by fire, right? The idea that his eyes are piercing and he sees and he can properly evaluate. His eyes are like a flame. He says he has many diadem crowns on his hand, on his head, excuse me. So I was thinking through that phrase, it reminded me of a little spit um, from the Lord of the Rings. They have that one powerful ring. It says, uh, one ring to rule them all. It's the one that's the super powerful one, okay? That is Christ here. He is the one. He has all the crowns. He has collected all the crowns because he is the only king and the great king. He comes with fiery flames in his eyes. Another observation about that first phrase you think of the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Christ is praying. He is in such agony. I'm sure there are tears, and then there is blood dripping from his head, right? He's broken those capillaries up there. He is in such anguish. Now he's coming with fire and crowns. He has a name, right? I love the second name. The name that no one knows except himself. What is that name? I don't know. There's a word, it's, the word is aseity, aseity. Um, I think it's spelled A-S-C-E-I-T-Y. The aseity of God, we see that here. What does that mean? It means that God is completely separate and distinct. 
Why is it that only he knows that name? It's because he's God and we're not. The aseity of God is that he is separate. He has created us. And the great news of the gospel is that he has come near to us. Verse 13, he is dressed in clothing, dipped in blood. This is not his blood from the cross. Rather, this is a picture of someone who has gone through the battlefield and the hem of his garments have touched all the carcasses that he is next to, and so it is stained with blood. That is the picture of Christ coming back. He's dressed, is dripped with blood. He's called our third name here, the Word of God. Quite fitting, the Revelation was written by the John the Apostle. As you go to the Gospel written by John the Apostle, what does it say? In the beginning was the Word. It's also rather fitting because Jesus is the agent of the Father. The Father sent him, and he sends him again. And so it's fitting as a picture of that, that he is described as the Word of God, the one who goes out from God doesn't mean he is less. We believe in the Trinity, what's called functional subordination, meaning that the Father submits, excuse me, the Son submits to the Father and the Spirit to the Son, but it does not make any inferior. But we see here the Son is sent, he is the Word of God, and then verse 14 describes the armies that come with him. These are believers, all believers. They are dressed in white, clean, fine linen. They're following on horses too. We get to come alongside. But we are more than, we are not really helpers. We are basically spectators because Christ does everything. I was reminded when we looked at the instructions for husbands, right? So it says, husbands in Ephesians are to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, right? Then he says, to sanctify her by cleansing her with the washing and all those things, right? Here we see the bride of Christ that has been purified, that has been washed, that has been redeemed, that has all their sins removed, and they are coming with Christ to watch him in his great revelation, his great revealing on this earth. The description continues in verse 15. From his mouth extends a sharp sword. How fitting for the word of God to have the sword coming out of his mouth. Again, a sign of power, of strength. Then we get a couple more actions here. It says he can strike the nations. Nations here is a way of saying basically everyone. He will come and he will strike everyone who is there. The second act, third action, excuse me, he will rule over them with an iron rod. Picture here is possibly something similar to a shepherd's crook, right? A rod used to direct, but this one is made out of iron. What does that mean? It means that when it hits you, you're in trouble. It's so strong and powerful, it crushes the enemy. He strikes the nation, the picture, the Old Testament of judgment. We see it now. Here comes Christ. He does it. He strikes them. He rules them with an iron rod. He stomps the winepress of the furious wrath of God. There's an interesting picture there. When we were kids, um, we had fish. We actually have fish now. It reminds me of growing up in the water. We had fish. We had a goldfish and two of these little, they're called zebra danios. They're like little minnow fish. And we didn't quite know how to take care of them. So every week we would do like someone who likes to clean's mother tells them, you pull all the fish out, put them in a separate container, and you spot, spotlessly clean their aquarium. If you have fish, you don't want to do that. It's actually good for them, okay? But we did that. And so we went, and we're going to push the fish back, and there goes the goldfish. There goes the one little zebra danio. Where is the other one? I don't know. The last one, okay. A couple minutes later, oh, there he is. My brother had squished him with his bare feet and didn't feel it. (laughs) You know, that little fish, when it was stepped on by even a little boy, was not a fish anymore. He was pretty flat. Sort of like when you put a blueberry in your mouth and it pops open. That's what happened to that little fish. 
When Jesus comes, he will stomp the winepress of the furious wrath of God. He will come, and just like my brother squished that little fish, his enemies, those who stand before him, he is going to just squish them. That is the picture of what Christ will do. His enemies stand no chance. He will stomp on them like someone crushes grapes or like a boy stands on a fish. Now, you might throw a a flag here and say, okay, what about Jesus is love? I thought Jesus was love. This doesn't look very loving, right? He's going to judge. He's going to war. He's striking. He's ruling. He's stomping. This isn't a very loving picture of Jesus. Can I just have my Christmas card back? Well, we can say two things. First of all, Christ is love, and he has proven it because he died on the cross to offer us forgiveness for our sins. Just like the same song we sang. How can we know he is good? Because of his blood. He shed it on the cross. He died for us. He demonstrated his love. But then why does he come back and and do this? Do these great rules, this great judging? Because in love, he is punishing evil. Think about all those who do such great wickedness and receive no consequences. Then this day, they will. All that is evil, all that is wicked, he will destroy. That is an act of love for his children. Picture a child outside playing. Here comes a snake. If you want to keep your child safe and you can't get them out quick enough, you might consider killing the snake, right? Right? You're saving your child from something that is going to hurt them. Christ is coming in love to destroy that is evil so that his children and him together can enjoy what is good. God has offered his love on the cross, and he says you can receive that, and if you don't, then you will receive his justice. Verse 16 the final name of the text. He has a name written on his clothing and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. There is none like him. This portrait inspires fear, it inspires awe, it inspires thankfulness. He is the one over everyone. There is no one who can stop him. Colossians says it this way, he is the firstborn, meaning that he is the most superior in rank. Says and continues, he says, Christ has made all things for himself. He's the head of the church. Philippians, he says, God highly exalted him. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will return. He will return with a sword in his mouth, with blazing eyes, riding on a horse. He will strike the nations. He will go to war. He will rule with an iron rod. He will stomp the furious wrath of God. This is Christ. Jesus is more than the baby at Christmas. He is more than the suffering servant on the cross, and he is more than the smiling, beaming Savior at Easter time. He is the conquering warrior, the destroyer of evil, and the rescuer of his people. Let's see what he does now. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, right? He's shouting out to the birds. He says, come and eat. Come and eat their flesh. In the first couple of years we lived at our house, um, in one summer we had a dog, a cat, and a deer that got hit on our road there. Okay? All within probably two months of each other. Okay? One after the other. And I'll never forget the deer. Uh, we were already, it's a Sunday morning, you know, we gotta go, we gotta go, gonna be late, you know, we can't be late, we're a pastor, we gotta go, get the kids in the car, we come out and Boom, there it is in the grass next to the car. Thanks. 
while we're still going to church, leave it there, right? You can't do anything about it. I'm not changing my clothes. We have to get to church. We'll deal with it when we get home. We're coming down the road. Let me get close to the house. And there's all these birds flying around. We pull around and pull in the driveway. They're all up in the trees. There were about 30 of the biggest, ugliest vultures you had ever seen picking at this thing. Ugh. Kids like, oh, what are those? God designed these birds to eat the wedge is dead. They're really quite honestly um, scientifically amazing if you like carrion birds, right? They're designed to eat these things, part of God's design. But we see here that this angel calls to the birds of the sky. He says, there's going to be a great banquet. There's going to be a great feast. It's an interesting word because earlier there's a great banquet for God's children. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. A great time of feasting and a fellowship where the saints gather together with Christ. And now we have a second banquet in quite a short bit of time, but this one's very different. This time there are people on the menu. It is the birds that will be eating. No one will escape it. It says, the flesh of all people, the last little bit of verse 18, free, slave, small, and great, there is no escape. No one gets special standing. There are no victims and anything else. No, everybody who is not with Christ is against Christ. And this angel is calling for the birds to come because they will feast on their bodies in just a short time. Verse 19, then I saw the beast, the king of the earth. Verse 20 describes also the false prophet. They have gathered together. This is what is, you might have heard it, the battle of Armageddon. They're in the valley of Megiddo. This is a time that has been prophesied against. Psalm chapter 2, a very interesting psalm, describes that all the nations of the earth gather together to go against God. This is that battle. This is the same area where Deborah and Barak saw a great victory, where Saul and Josiah were killed. It has seen many battles before, but it will not see anyone except, not seen one like this. This will be the worst. All the nations of the earth, led by the beast and the false prophet, will be there. The beast and the false prophet, if you go back to Revelation chapter 13, you are see that they are not divine, they are not angels, they are human beings that Satan empowers to do his bidding to lead people astray. It is, as I've heard uh, explained, this is sort of like a false trinity of sorts, where you have Satan, you have the beast, which is Antichrist, and you have the false prophet working together to deceive the nations. And they will come with their forces to try to fight the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They have um, come to do battle but it's not going to be much of a battle. Verse 20 says, the beast was seized along with the false prophet. This is a strong word. This isn't like a, I caught it. This is like a full-on football tackle. They are caught. They are described the end of verse 20 there. They are thrown alive into the lake of fire. This is the final resting place for God's enemies. And the beast that is Antichrist, the false prophet, these two men, they are the first to fully enter the lake of fire for all eternity. But they're not the only ones who will enter it. Verse 21, the others were killed by the sword. Who are these others? They're everyone mentioned before. Free, slave, small, great, generals, kings, all of them. They were killed by what? The sword that extended from the mouth of the one who rode the horse. The word of the Lord, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who is faithful in the truth, the one who has a name that no one knows, the ones whose eyes are burning, the one whose clothes are dipped with blood, with the sword that comes out of his mouth. He will obliterate his enemies. And so we end up with that last bit of the sentence. And all the birds gorged themselves with their flesh. It was sort of nasty looking out the window watching the vultures pick at the deer in our yard. It's an unsightly sight. 
But it's exactly what this text portrays. The vultures and the seagulls, the many birds that actually go through this area, are gathered around picking off the carcasses of the thousands and thousands who came to war against Jesus. Our culture has a fascination with superheroes. There's a lot of superhero movies out there. And superhero movies always have the same, uh, same thing, right? Same story line. Here's the hero. Oh, it looks really, really bad. And then the hero struggles really, really hard, and he wins, right? They're all the same. So there, I spoiled all of them for you. You don't need to watch them. I read an article one time that drew an interesting line. It says, one of the reasons, the, the point of the article they were trying to say is, one of the reasons superhero movies are so popular is that we are looking for a hero. We are looking for a conqueror who will destroy evil and do what is right. I know who he is. <laughs> He's Jesus. But unlike all these other heroes who have to fight physically, they have to exert themselves, they have to struggle, they barely win the fight, Jesus comes down and with the word of his mouth obliterates his enemies. This is not a battle. This is like me playing basketball with middle schoolers. It's easy to dunk when they're not as tall as you. No one will escape. There is no escape for Satan, no escape for those who are with him. They will be destroyed by our great Savior. Revelation of Christ, the picture of Christ here we get is one of a terrifying, powerful warrior. And when he returns, he will lay to waste his enemies. He will squish them. They will not stand a chance. Why did we go through this text? Why are we here? Well, remember I said that question at the very beginning, right? Why bother with Jesus? Well, the answer is, look at who he is and what he is going to do. This is the final portrait of Jesus. The conquering king who will come with his children and his children will watch him as he destroys everything that is evil. I don't know about you, but I want to be on one of the horses not out on the battlefield. Jesus matters because he is the all-powerful King of kings and Lord of lords. It matters whether or not we build our life on him because he is the one who every knee will bow before. He is the one who will examine every life and every heart. He matters. So what does this mean for us? Well, I think we can put it together in one sentence. Let us rejoice and be ready to meet Christ. Let us rejoice and be ready to meet Christ. It's fairly simple. Why do you say rejoice? This is like a really nasty, bloodthirsty portion of Scripture, right? The birds are pecking at the dead folks. Why do you rejoice? Because evil is vanquished. Sometimes if you turn on the TV, you can look at it and go, oh my word, it looks like evil is winning. Look at all the nonsense out there in the world. Look at all the wickedness, the violence, the evil. We can rejoice because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to come down and he is going to squish. He is going to use the sword that comes out of his mouth and he will destroy that which is evil. And so we can and we should rejoice in Christ. But not only must we rejoice in him, we must be ready to meet him. 
Christians, today we can rejoice because we will be on the horse (laughs) and not on the battlefield when he returns. What a sense of relief, right? But Christ will still look into our lives. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, that he will examine our lives. He does not do this to judge us for our sin. He has paid for our sin fully. God, as we see this, as we said, he is faithful and true. He will not judge us for our sin because he paid for our sin. Our sins are forgiven. But he will be like the master in the parables who returns and he says to his servants, what did you do with what I gave you? Right? The parable of the towns. You got two. What did you do with them? You got four. What did you do with them? That will happen. It will be an opportunity to earn rewards, like we talked about last week, for those who faithfully pursue Christ. I don't know about you, but I want to hear, well done. Building our lives on Christ matters because we will stand before him. We can and we will rejoice. We are on his team, but he's still going to say, what did you do for the team? It is an opportunity to serve Christ, to show in thankfulness, Lord, you loved me when I did not deserve it. Lord, let me demonstrate my love for you through my obedience to you. And Christ, when we meet him, he will examine us. He will say, I gave you many tests of obedience to see if you were faithful. He says, it's time to go over the grade. Are you ready? How would you do on that test? If we know Christ as our Savior, building our lives on Christ matters because look who He is. We will stand before Him. Christians, we ought to rejoice and we ought to be ready to meet Him. That means that we must, by faith, be wise and apply ourselves to the Scripture and by faith obey the instructions He has given to us. I want to close with one last thing here. I mentioned this is the application for Christians. But if you do not know Christ, this doesn't apply to you. None of what I just said applies to you. Instead, you ought to be fearful. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, you will not be riding on the horse with the King of Kings in front of you, leading you on. You will not be watching him stomp and destroy that is evil. You will be on the receiving end. If you have not had your sins forgiven in full by trusting in the death of Christ to pay for your sins and his resurrection to give you new life, if you have never done that, you are on the opposite team. God loves you. He loves you so much that before Christ comes as the conquering king, he came as the baby at Christmas. He was the suffering servant on the cross, and then he was the rejoicing live Savior at Easter. He says, I offer you my love and my forgiveness, but if you will not receive it, then you are not on his team. And when he returns, he will not examine your life to say, okay, did you obey me or not? He will examine your life to see the sin in your life, and then he will sentence you to the same place that the beast and the false prophet have been sent, the lake of fire for all eternity. So today, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, I urge you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know when he will come and take his church. We do not know when that will occur. We do not know how long our life will be, but we can know for sure that our eternal destiny is secured. If you do not know Christ as your Savior today, what I would encourage you to do is after our invitation song, come to me. 
or you can talk to Mr. Pat or one of our deacons, or if you're here, you don't know anyone, look at someone who's here as a church member. Hey, tell me more about this. There is nothing more important. Perhaps, I guess I should speak to one more group of people here. Perhaps you say, I'm not so sure. (laughs) That was me when I was in middle school. That's a miserable place to be. Because every time you hear a text like this, you go, oh no! (laughs) You ought to. But as he says in the Word, these things are written so that you might know you have eternal life. Not wish, not guess, but know. Understanding the gospel is what you need. Again, if you are in that circumstance where you're like, I'm not sure, get it straight. Come before Christ. Ask for his forgiveness. He will forgive you. And then instead of being on the receiving side, you will be with Christ when he returns. You will be with all of us who know him as his Savior, the bride who enjoy the great marriage supper with him and then return to earth earth, to watch him destroy what is evil and to prepare that thousand-year kingdom of pure joy. And then after that, forever. If you know Christ as your Savior, let us rejoice. But let us also be ready to meet Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we are reminded here of who you are. Lord, yes, you were the perfect, the innocent child at Christmas. Yes, Lord, you were the Lamb of God, the suffering servant on the cross. Yes, Lord, you were the excited, you were the um, rejoicing, risen Savior. But you were also the warrior with the sword. Lord, I pray we might never forget the portrait of Christ that we see here in Revelation 19. Lord, you will return. We long for that day. We rejoice in the day. We say, come quickly. Lord, there is evil. Great evil. But we know you will destroy it. Lord, if there's anyone here who does not know you as their Savior or is unsure if you are their Savior, Lord, do not let them find peace until they find you. And Lord, for your children here today, may we never forget how great you are. May we rejoice in you, Lord, and may we be ready. Lord, when you come back, may you find us building on your word through faith. May you find us building our hearts, our lives, our homes on you and for you. So that when we stand before you, you look at us and say, Well done. Lord, encourage us, instruct us with these words. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.